the name of God who loves the world, welcome. So what do you think about as you prepare for worship? You know, like as, you, as you're driving into the church building, what's on your mind? What's on your mind as you come into the narthex? How about as you sit in the pew waiting for the corporate worship to begin? What's on your mind? The truth is, often we're so focused on ourselves rather than on the God that we've come today to worship. That's called living in the dark. And we're called to live in the light. Another question. How many people have you told this week about the love of God and, and how he's changed your life? There is nothing more important that you could possibly convey to anyone than that. So while I hope you begin worshiping earlier as you sat down, let's begin our corporate worship with a call to worship. We gather to share in our love of God. We gather to share our witness to God's goodness. We've gathered to praise God whose love is eternal. We worship God because he is everything. More than that, he gave everything to show us how very much he loves us. So let's sing, You Are My All in All. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy Oh, yeah. 
Let's pray together. Lord, as we gather here to praise and worship you, we remember you have shared with us your most precious gift, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to model our lives after his messages of compassion and service to you and to all your world. In Jesus' name, we offer this prayer. You may be seated. We have been born into a world of sin. We try to do the right thing, but at times we fail, and temptation seems to win. At other times, we seem to drown in our failures, believing nothing good can come from us. We forget God has called us to repent, and God remembers our sins no more. We extinguish this candle as a symbol of our trust in Jesus that our sins are forgiven when we repent and turn back to God. Let's pray. Loving God, help us to turn back to you when we stray. As we journey toward the cross this Lenten season, help us repent from where we have gone wrong. Today's scripture is one of the most familiar ones ever, so I'm sure you all already know it. It comes from John chapter 3. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling class. He came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, so whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light, for fear their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so it may be, seen, may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's sing about God's divine love.
So Ernest Shackleton was a celebrated explorer um, at the beginning of the 20th century, so 100 years ago. In his writings, he describes some of the tasks that uh, he and his companions faced as they were preparing for an expedition to the South Pole. He was the first guy who ever managed to get there. Now, now they, they knew uh, once they got there, they would have to leave some of their possessions behind. They knew that they couldn't get back with everything they'd taken with them. And uh, Shackleford writes he was profoundly impressed with the things his companions considered important, and contrasting with that, the things they didn't think were quite as important. For example, they took the money out of their pockets and left it behind. Even a knapsacks full of food they left behind. What they did not leave behind were the pictures of loved ones that they had carried with them from home. These they carried all the way back. They also carried letters that they had received from their loved ones. I suspect after a year of a lockdown with COVID that there are some folks who kind of get that. Today, I want us to think about and talk about love, the kind of love that caused those explorers to leave behind all kinds of material things and cling to pictures and letters from their loved ones. Our text is the best love verse in the entire Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, here's the thing, that's not the kind of love we really hear about in our world today. The word love is used and misused all the time. I mean, after all, love, it's what makes a Subaru a Subaru. What does that even mean? Every time I hear that commercial, I don't know. The word love has been abused in so many ways that honestly, when I started thinking about um, what I was going to say this morning, I thought, let's throw away the whole word for right now and use the word relationship. The older I get, the more convinced I become that the only thing in life that truly matters are relationships. Money? What's money? Now, of course, we need enough to, to meet our daily needs, obviously. But if somebody says, I would take a million dollars for my child, usually he or she really does mean that. Money means nothing in comparison to the people we love. Success. What's success? Well, often the most miserable person in the world is the person on top of the ladder. So everybody in the world pats you on the back and tells you what a great person you are. What is that in comparison to have someone very close to you, very committed to you, whisper, I love you, and really mean it? Let me say it again. The only thing that really counts in life are our relationships. So there are three very important relationships that I want us to focus on today. The first relationship is the relationship we have with those closest to us. Love actually is what makes the world go round. What a great and wonderful thing to love and to be loved. How long has it been, my dear friends, since you really told those people you are closest to them, you love them? Don't you realize that that's the one thing that matters the very most to them? So love them while there's still time. The young family had a little girl, about three years old. They also had a brand new baby boy. And that can be quite an adjustment in a family. Well, an insurance salesman stopped by the house and, you know, saw the new little baby and asked the little girl, how do you like your new little brother? Oh, no, she said, I don't like him. And the parents were horrified. But they hadn't given her time to finish her sentence. She said, I don't like him. I love him. Even at such an early age, that little girl understood what was really important in life. Our relationships with those who are the closest to us. How quick we are 
to forget that simple fact. We who are so very busy working ourselves into an early grave so that we can give our families all the material blessings of life that they'll either need or want. But the one thing they really want from us is to hear how much we love them. We've, I think, um, as we've been sequestered, learned a little bit about how much we, we love our families. It might have given some of our families a little bit of time to reconnect. But there's another family we don't talk about really all that often, maybe we should, and that's the total human family to which we all belong. The family which includes every single person on this earth. After the death of author F. Scott Fitzgerald, some of his friends decided to help out and go through some of his papers, and they started, you know, wandering through. And um, as they started, you know, digging through the papers, they found um, quite a few unfinished plots. He started quite a few stories that he never finished. One of these plots had to do with the members of an estranged family who inherits this very large house. In order to take possession of the house, however, there was one requirement. They had to prove they could live happily in it together. Now, the story was never finished, so we don't know how it turns out, whether they managed to get the house or not. I do know some families, however, frankly, would make it through. But let's think about that for a few minutes. Humanity is very much in the same position. We all have inherited a house, this wonderful earth. It's, it's a really big house, and we're a really big family. There are billions of us. We're a very diverse family. Chinese, Japanese, Africans, Indians, Russians, Europeans, North and South Americans. We've inherited a wonderful house, and our task is to learn how to live in it together. Isn't it tragic that the human family has been so torn apart through the ages, by so much hatred, so much violence. And a lot of it is so very meaningless. If only we could realize we're all children of the same God. The rabbis used to tell a story of the Exodus. The story goes that God was very busy when the um, Israelites were leaving Egypt in fact, he was too busy to see to the parting of the Red Sea. So he appointed a committee of angels. And he told the committee of angels they should be in charge of parting the sea so the children of Israel could walk through it. So they do that. They part the sea, the Israel children walk through, and then here come the Egyptians. So the angels wait and wait until the Egyptians reach the middle of the sea, and the angels cause all the waters to close in um, and drown the entire Egyptian army. Triumphantly, the angels shout and cheered, We got him! We got him! Yay, we got him! And then God looks over the banister of heaven, and he says to this committee of angels, You're no longer in my service. But we got him, the angels protested. And God said, Don't you know? The Egyptians are also my children. And I want to remind you again who tells that story. It's not the Egyptians. It's the rabbis. We are all children of God. Recently heard a powerful story about a guy named Fuad Bachman. Uh, Fuad was a Christian pastor in Beirut, Lebanon, after the last Arab-Israel war. In 1983, the Israeli army um, invades Lebanon. There was a rumor before it happened that, in fact, Israel was going to um, have a prolonged siege of Beirut. And so members of Fuad's church began to buy up all the canned food that they could possibly put their hands on so they could survive. I mean, they had no idea how long the siege would last, so they bought up every can of food they could find. And, as it turns out, their fears were justified. West Beirut was completely and totally cut off. And so the official body of the church decides they have to meet to figure out how we're going to distribute the food that they bought up. 
And so when they start the meeting, there are two proposals placed on the table. The first propo proposal was to distribute the food to the church family first, then distribute it to the other Christians, you know, in the neighborhoods around them. And if there's any food left, give it to the Muslim neighbors they had. The second proposal was very different. First, the food would be given to their Muslim neighbors. Then it would be given to the other Christians in the neighborhood. And finally, if there was any food left over, that would go to the church members. Well, they, they you know, talked back and forth for six hours. And they didn't, it wasn't heated, but you know, they couldn't agree. If the meeting finally ended when an older, quiet, and very much respected elder of the church, a woman, it just happened to be a woman, stood up and said, if we do not demonstrate the love of Christ in this place, who will? And guess what? The second motion passed. They distributed the food to their Muslim neighbors first. I truly wonder how many Christian congregations in our land would vote the same way. After reading that story, I wondered what we would do in our church. If we do not demonstrate the love of Christ in this place, then who will? That'd be a good motto for the church today, not, not just here, but everywhere around the world. That's the second family to which we all belong, the human family. But of course, there is a third relationship that is more important than all other relationships that we can possibly have, and that's our relationship with God. This is love, says 1 John 4.10. Not that we loved God, but he loved us, and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. What a powerful sentence. Not that we loved God, but he loved us. Lucy Hayes was the wife of Ruford B. Hayes, who was the 19th president of the United States. In 1964, Lucy Hayes received news. Her husband, who was a colonel in the Union Army um, in the Civil War, was killed in action. She was devastated. Later that evening, she received a telegram saying Hayes had been um, badly injured. He wasn't dead. He was badly injured. It was a battle in Virginia. Lucy didn't know what to think. So which one of these, you know, communications is true? Either way, she was frantic. Was he dead or was he alive? Well, she couldn't get any communication. You know, communication was um, particularly difficult in those times. And obviously in a time of war, it's even worse. So whether he was dead or alive, Lucy was determined that she was going to find her husband and she was going to bring him home. So she sets out on a journey during through very dangerous territory to find him. And um, as you probably know, that's just not something a woman did back then. She went through bloody scorched battlefields. <clears throat> she walked through crude hospitals until finally, two weeks after she left home, Lucy found her husband. He was injured, but he was very much alive. When he campaigned for the presidency a few years later, Ruth B. Hayes told sympathetic audiences his loving, about his loving wife who risked her life, wandering all over kingdom come in search of her husband's corpse, only to find him alive and kicking. Well, in the same way, imagine God wandering all over kingdom come in order to bring us home into a loving relationship with him. This is love, not that we first loved God, but he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Then the author of 1 John adds these words. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. That's what life is all about loving relationships with those who are closest to us, with the rest of God's children who are scattered all over the world, and with the God who created us and sustains us with his love today. How about you? 
Chances are, before you finish going through this life, you will face many hardships and a lot of distress. Have you developed a relationship with God that will take you through, will give you the strength to bear any and all of the burdens that you'll have to endure, the heartaches? Will it, will it leave you victorious over every evil you have to face? One last story. You can recall in the early days of printing, book printers had to hand uh, set every um, book by hand. They would literally put in every letter by hand. That's how it happened. It was very arduous, um, took a lot of time. It was painstaking work at a you know, triple check. You didn't misspell anything. It said whenever printers would receive an order to print a collection of Alfred Lord Tennyson's poems, they immediately would have to order hundreds of extra letters, extra L's and extra V's. They knew that Lord Tennyson used the word love more than anybody else in, in his poetry. And the average set of letters that a printer would have would not possibly be able to handle the necessary letters. It is with that same kind of extravagant love that God loves us. It would take all of the L's, all of the O's, all of the V's, and all of the E's in the entire universe to begin to describe his love. God so loved the world proclaims our lesson for today. Here's the most amazing thing about the Christian faith. It is the message the Creator God who brought into being everything that is or will ever be wants to have an intimate relationship with every single person on this earth. It doesn't make any difference where you came from, who you are, or even what you've done. God wants to be closer to you than any friend, any associate, any spouse you've ever known. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, so whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God wants an intimate and personal relationship with you. All you have to do is give him your heart. Let's pray. Forgiving God, we come today confessing our sin. We can be impatient, complaining, and troubled. We seem content to be dead in our trespasses because we're afraid to embrace the changes which come with the new life you offer. Save us. God so lo loved the world that Jesus was sent to show us the way to eternal life. We are not condemned, but we are offered saving grace. Come to the light. Let it melt away your resistance to God's truth. God sends the Spirit to recreate us into the very likeness of Jesus. Amen. So as we come to our prayer time, do we have any joys or concerns to share today? Yes, Cecilia. Okay. Okay. We need to keep praying for Wayne. Um, he has been moved to ICU, so lots of lots of things going on there. Not good things. Yes, Jen. Vince is 11. Happy birthday. Yes. Okay. Caleb's next heart scan is March the 30th. I want to pray for that. Yes. Kay is doing much better. That's a real joy. Amen. 
Anybody else? Um, Pam Fulmer got a hold of me last night to let me know that um, her niece, Debbie, died, so we want to hold uh, the family in prayer. Um, also, I've been asking you to pray for my brother, Jeff's friend, Jeff, not that that's confusing. Um, Jeff McCullough's family um, received um, very frightening news yesterday, so um, please, please pray for them as they make decisions in the coming days. Everybody? Let's pray. Gracious and patient God, the days are getting longer. The sun's rays are higher in the sky, bringing more light into our world. Warmth begins to flood our nation. Let the warmth of your mercy and love pour over us. As we've gathered this day to celebrate the good news you've given to the world, remind us it is our purpose to offer good news to others, not only in words, but in deeds of love and mercy, peace, and justice. We've offered names of people and situations which have been heavy on our hearts for your healing mercies. Some, Lord, we've said out loud, and Lord, there are others we've only mentioned in our hearts. We remember now those who suffer, those who struggle, those who are lost, and those who are lonely. Remind us we are on a journey of peace and justice whenever we offer comfort and aid to others. Be with us during this Lenten season. Give us hearts of great joy and courage to serve you all our days. Open our hearts today as we truly share our love, concerns, and resources. Let your light of compassion shine in us. Having received your light, send us forth into the world as healing agents, bringing your peace and your love. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God loves us, and when we have sin in our life, we cannot approach God. But once we have God's forgiveness, we absolutely can. So here's the good news. God's grace is available to all of us. So let's stand and sing together, Grace Greater Than All Our Sin.
God sent Jesus to, so the world may believe. God sends us into the world to share that good news. Let everyone see the light you received. Live as one who enjoys the love of God. Amen.